In this section of our course, we'll continue to work with CSS properties in more depth. To start off with, we're going to be talking about shorthand properties. Now we've already covered some of the shorthand properties in previous lessons, but I do want to delve a little bit deeper into this topic. Shorthand properties are CSS properties that let you set the values of multiple other CSS properties simultaneously. Using a shorthand property, you can write more concise and often more readable style sheets. This will save time and energy. Now we've already discussed shorthand properties briefly in regards to the font properties, but many of the other CSS properties allow you to use shorthand as well. For this section of the course, we will discuss shorthand properties in regards to how they relate to the box model. These will be things like padding, margin, borders, outline, and we'll also look at shorthand properties for lists as well as for the background property. In regards to the box model, you'll need to understand a few handling properties in how they relate to the edge of the box. These are properties like margin, padding, and border style. These will always use a consistent one to four value syntax representing those edges. Let's go ahead and see what this looks like on an actual page. Here's the web page that we're going to be working on. It has a section element with a variety of HTML elements inside. I'll go into the style file and you can see I already have some rules specified. What I want to do to start off with is I want to make the size of the text more consistent. Now I showed you earlier how we could set the size of the text for paragraph elements. We could open up a P selector and then we can use our font size property and we've used the 1.5 rems which in this case is going to be equal to 15 pixels if i do that my paragraphs will change and display the new font size but the other elements the list and this is just a div with some text inside it those are not being updated so in order to target those i would either have to use a group selector and specify the other elements or to make this more consistent, I'm going to actually move this rule, the font size of 15 rems, and I'm going to put this into the body rule that I've already established. If I move the font size to this particular rule and get rid of the selector that I had just made and I refresh, you can see that now all of the text is consistent. What this means is that the base font size for all body elements has now been specified. Now I do have rules on my heading elements that are overriding that so that these elements are going to appear larger. We learned in an earlier lesson that we can use the font shorthand to specify font size and font family. That would look like this. I would just write font, then I would write the font size, and then I would go ahead and specify the font family. And in this case, I'm using a font stack. I'll just go ahead and comment these two lines out. And if we save the page and refresh, nothing will have changed. Clearly, this is a more concise manner of specifying both font size and font family. Let's move on and talk about some of those box related shorthand properties. In order to illustrate this, I'm going to open up my developer tools. I'll right click on my page and select inspect. This is going to open the developer tools up if we come to the three dots, I can tell the developer tools to dock to the bottom of the page, which will allow us to split the page horizontally rather than vertically. Now, if I hover over any of the elements on the page, you can see that in some instances we'll see a blue outline, which of course is the text element, and then sometimes we'll see orange, which is margin, and sometimes we'll see green, which is padding. Many of these elements that I have on my page have some built-in padding and or margin already applied to them. What we want to do is we want to overwrite the padding and margin settings and define that uniquely on our page. I'm going to do this on my div element. The div element currently has no padding and no margin specified. If we come to the rule that we already have and I specify padding, and let's just say I want the padding to be the same all the way around. I'll set this to 1M, which is going to be the equivalent of 15 pixels. And then in addition to that, I'm going to set margin. And let's make the margin 2Ms. That would be the equivalent of 30 pixels. 
If we refresh, you can see that the div has moved and it looks bigger. If I hover over the div element, you can see that now we have the blue element, which is the text node. We have the green, which is the padding, and then we have the margin. Now the margin is actually expanding all the way to the right because this element is a block level element. And since the element is being defined as having a width, the margin is just going to appear to take up the rest of the page. If I get rid of the width, you'll see that now the two rems of space in regards to margin is going to show up. Currently, I'm using shorthand property. When you just define one unit of measurement, it is assigning this value to all four sides of the box. If we wanted the element to have a different amount of padding on all sides, we have a couple different options to define that. What we can do is we can specify padding dash top and if I set the padding top to three rems, what's going to happen is the box is first going to render out with the one rem of padding. Then we have a more specific rule, padding top, which is going to overwrite the initial padding and make the padding on the top three rems. So if I wanted the padding element to be different all the way around the box. I could do that for each specific side. Padding right, if we make that half a rem. Padding bottom, if we set that to 10 pixels. And padding left. And we can set this to one rem. Now you'll see when I hover over the box, the green padding information is not the same. And that's because we've specified every side to have a unique padding. Even though I have the shorthand property of padding M, this is being overwritten by these more specific selectors. So clearly, if you wanted to have different padding amounts all the way around the box, it's going to take four lines of code. Luckily, we don't have to write it like this. We can combine these into one property. And we would do that by writing padding and then I'm just going to start with the top value, which in this case is three rems. I'm going to go to the right, which in this case is half a rem. I'm going to use a space and specify the bottom, which is 10 pixels. And then finally, I'm going to specify the left value, which is one rem. This one line of code is exactly the same as these four lines of code. If we save the page and we refresh, you'll see that no change has occurred in the browser, and that's because they are the same. Clearly, this is a much more concise way to represent these four rules. You need to put the values in this order. Think about how a clock works. So you start at the top, you go to the right, you go down to the bottom, and then you go to the left. It is possible to use less values. For instance, if I use three values, then we're assigning the first value to the top, the second value gets assigned to the right and the left, and the third value gets assigned to the bottom. So if I refresh now, you're gonna see that I have equal values of padding on the right and the left, that's 10 pixels. I'm using one rem on the bottom, which is the equivalent of 15, and three rems on the top. Conversely, if you just define two values, then you're defining top and bottom with the first value and right and left with the second value. So if we refresh once again, you can now see on my div that I have three rems on the top and bottom and 10 pixels on the right and the left. And then one value is assigning all four sides. So in this way, you can use just padding you don't have to use these specific properties to target the various parts of the box. You can be more concise just using shorthand. I'm going to eliminate all of these padding and just end up with my shorthand version. Margin works in the exact same way, so the same exact rules are going to apply to margin. It is worth noting that on this element, I'm also using shorthand notation on the border element. For the border element, I'm specifying the border style as solid, the border width as one pixel, and the border color as this midtone gray. 
if we wanted to write this out using the long hand, it would be border dash style, and then we can specify the style. In this case, I'm using solid. We could then specify border dash width, and I'll change the width just so we can see the update. And then I can do border dash color. And let's just make this red so we can see a change. If I refresh now, you can see that this div now switches and we have still a solid border. We have the width of five pixels and the color of red. If I wanted to make this shorthand, I would simply write border. I would pass in solid, five pixels, and red. It is worth noting that the order of these elements does not matter. You don't have to put them in this specific order. I recommend that you just come up with an order that works for you. I always like to define style, width, and then color, but as I mentioned, it could be in any order and it would still work in the same way. If you wanted the border to be different on the various sizes of the box, we could use border width. And then similar to what we were using on padding and margin, we could specify the border width. So if I make the top five pixels, if I make the right one pixel, if I make the bottom 10 pixels, and I make the left eight pixels, and we save, you'll see when I refresh my page, the width on the border is now different all the way around. So I'm using the same shorthand method that I used on padding and would use on margin to specify border width. If you use the shorthand property of simply border, you cannot specify different widths all the way around. So if you did want to do that, you would need to define it in this way. It's also worth mentioning that you don't need to assign all three values. So if I comment this out for a moment and I get rid of the five pixels and we just have solid and red for the border, you'll see that the border is going to default to having a five pixel width because we had specified that before and then its color is red and the style is solid. If we get rid of both of these rules and we save the page and refresh, you're gonna see that the border is going to switch to the default width. And as soon as you turn on border style of solid, the width will display even though we did not define a width. If you want to know what that is, you can come to the computed and you can see that the border is currently three pixels. That is the default browser styling. But if we did not define a style, we would not see the border. Finally, I want to show you how we can define a shorthand property for our list. So we currently do not have any rules for the list element. Let's go ahead and make a rule for our unordered list. And for the unordered list, we already talked about how we can use a list style type. Currently, it is using the default value of disk. If I change the list style type to circle, you'll see that when we save and refresh, we get hollow circles. We might also want to control the position of the bullets. So we do this by using our list style position and we can use an inside or outside. Inside is something where we'll see a difference. So if I refresh, you can see how my list appears to move. If we hover over the list and look at it, you'll see how the bullets currently appear inside the blue area. If I come back to styles and temporarily disable list style position and I hover, you can see how by default the bullets appear on the outside of the list. Because our list has some padding, if we were to remove the padding, so I'm gonna set the padding all the way around to zero, you'll see that the list is going to move closer to the left. There's no indentation. And if my list style position was set to outside, we wouldn't actually see the bullets because they exist somewhere out here off of the page. So if this was my intention, I would certainly need to change the list style position to inside so we would see the bullets. We also looked at how we could change the type of bullet. So if I use my list style image, I could set the bullet to a custom image. Now I have created an image 
and placed it in my images folder and it is just called triangle.png. If we save and refresh, you'll see that now I have my custom triangle elements showing as my list. In regards to shorthand, I could combine this into one line of code. Now to invoke the shorthand, I'm just simply going to specify list style, and then I can pass in any of these values. You do not have to pass in all of these values. So if I use list style and I specify outside and we save, now the list has moved and we no longer see the bullets. This rule is overriding this. If I wanted to pass on other attributes, so let's change this back to inside so we can see our bullets and then let's pass on the type of square. If I save my page now and I refresh, you'll see that now this rule is overriding both the list style image as well as the list style type and we see our square bullets. You could go ahead and specify the URL value and I'll just use the same image since I don't have another image. And now if we save the list style image will overwrite the list style type. So normally you would not use both list style type and list style image. As you can see, being able to be more concise with your styles will save you typing and will also help you to create more concise code. Whenever possible, you want to try to use your shorthand notation and we are doing that here on our color as well. The hex value for this is technically 33, 33, 33. So there's six threes. But because this is a web safe color, I can just represent it by just putting 333. I do not need to put all six characters if it is web safe. Now, if you're using a color that is not web safe, so if I change this color to something that is not web safe, there is no way for me to create a shorthand value of this particular color. I would have to just use the longhand. But if it is a web safe color, which is going to consist of 0, 3, 6, 9s, Fs, and Cs, and they're always paired, you can go ahead and represent it by simply writing the shorthand version, and that will give you the exact same color. Now currently, our shorthand version of border with the color of red is overriding the pink. So even if we save our page, we will not see the pink. As we continue through the course, you'll notice that I often use the shorthand method whenever I can. This is, as I mentioned, more concise. It makes your code easier to read. And ultimately, your CSS file could load a little bit faster since you are going to eliminate so many lines of code.